whatever their capabilities, Krav Maga has got to conform to them. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 366. Today, I'm joined by Chief Instructor David Kahn. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. And I'm just a guy who loves martial arts, so I made it my job. You can find all the different things that I do with Whistlekick and the rest of the team does with Whistlekick at pretty easy whistlekick.com. You can find the show notes for this and all of the other episodes. We never put them behind a paywall at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And you know, we've got most of our products available on Amazon, but if you want to buy direct, we'll save you a few bucks. You can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on our foam sparring gear, our Olympic Taekwondo sparring gear, forearm guards, shin guards, uniforms. What else we have over there? That's the heart of it. And there's more coming all the time. Oh yeah, we've got apparel, shoes, hats, Lots of good stuff for you to express to the world that you're a martial artist, that you love martial arts. Maybe, but probably not as much as I do. (laughs) We've had quite a few people on the show over the years who have participated in Krav Maga, even some who have converted, in a sense, who left the more quote-unquote traditional, the more traditionally traditional martial arts like karate or taekwondo and embraced Krav Maga, which... I still consider to be a traditional martial art. But today's guest, Chief Instructor Khan, is a Krav Maga native. It's the art that he started in. It's the art that he continues to practice. And now, 25 years later, it's the art that he is traveling the world, sharing with not only other martial artists, but first-time martial artists and even the military. We talk about a ton of stuff today from cultural influences on Krav Maga to how Krav Maga's changed who he is. So let me step back and welcome him to the show. Chief Instructor Khan, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, sir. It's great to be on here. Thank you. Hey, it's great to have you. I appreciate you coming on. You know, we're going we're gonna to get into some stuff today, aren't we? I mean, we were just chatting for a few minutes and you, you've got stories. I can tell. I can tell already. <laughs> Thanks again. I'm honored to be on the show. <laughs> Well, before we get into stories, we got to know a little bit about who you are. So we start in the most fundamental of ways. How did you find the martial arts? It wasn't until my uh, first year of law school that I encountered uh, the instructor, Rick Blitzy, my first Krav Maga instructor. Uh, Prior to that, I played uh, football at Princeton University. And I suppose the only self-defense I had at that point was running with somebody full speed with my head. (laughs) <laughs> which was not the uh, the best uh, defense for sure. Um, but I'd always been interested in, in the martial arts. I just hadn't um, had the opportunity really to invest in it. And um, Krav Maga fit the bill um, simply because the more work you put in, the more one got out. Um, so it, it was immediate gratification. So um, I didn't have any uh, experience prior to meeting Rick Blitzen, my uh, my first week of law school. And so then the, the next obvious question is why, you know, what, what got you in there? Uh, you know, I was interested in continuing my, uh, my fitness regimen and um, self-defense and martial arts had always been, uh, you know, of interest. Um, I, I, I tend to be in, uh, intense at what I do. So I was looking for something that would um, provide immediate uh, gratification, if, if you will. And um, I just been in Israel that summer working with technology. Um, and I, after attending Princeton, I, I um, worked for a year. And then I went to Israel uh, within that year. So on coming back, I'd just been to Israel, and I happened to stumble on um, Rick uh, underneath a sukkah, uh, which is an um, outdoor structure uh, in Judaism that uh, is used to, to commemorate and, um, uh, for several holidays. And I saw a Krav Maga shirt that he was wearing. It said Krav Maga. I remember to this day, a black shirt, and then it says Israeli martial arts below it. Um, I'd never heard of Krav Maga before. In fact, I didn't even pronounce it correctly for probably the first few weeks that I was um, training in it. And uh, for those who are not familiar with the term, uh, Krav means struggle or fight, and Maga means close. So it's usually translated as close combat. Um, But I saw Rick, and I said, uh, Krav Maga, uh, what is that? He said, oh, that's Israeli hand-to-hand combat. And I looked at him expressively and said, wow. 
he, he sized me up. He said, yeah, you look like you'd like to do this. I was still weightlifting and running and that sort of thing. He said, you ought to come on by. I said, I'd, I'd love to, but I'm a first year law student and I really got to um, focus on my studies. Uh, I, I, academics were important to me. I graduated Princeton with honors and everything, but law school was a different uh, animal. And I took one week of uh, classes and decided this was awful. What am I doing here? But I'll, I'll continue. And I went to Rick and said, hey, I'd like to start training. And um, honestly, the training with Rick uh, and the friendship I developed with him got me through uh, law school, which I absolutely hated. It was a good education, I suppose. But um, it just wasn't uh, the ideal thing for me to, to be doing. But um, the training got me through it. Um, so I began with him, and I trained for three years as often as I could, taking as many private lessons as I could. He was ultra generous in, in not uh, quoting me a high rate so I could afford it. And I began to help him uh, teach down in Miami. Um, and one word about Rick, uh, he was actually the first American to ever be exposed to Krav Maga. Um, in 1977, he was in Israel on a kibbutz, which is a, um, uh, sort of a farming establishment. Uh, it was an early experiment in socialism, and they still have them in Israel. And he had done Kung Fu for a number of years. And he was practicing uh, Kung Fu um, on his own. And a couple of the kibbutzniks or the members of the kibbutz saw him and said, what is that? And he said, Kung Fu. They said, you look like you like martial arts. He said, yes. And then they invited him subsequently to a training session. And he had his, quote, rear end handed to him. And they were impressed because he kept coming back for more. And they were taking him down. They were, were hitting him in all the vital places. They were using knives, guns, everything that, that um, you, you understand is, you know, sort of a military bent to it or street, depending where you are. And uh, he loved it. So he kept coming back. And um, ultimately, they had him perform a few of the things that they showed him to two older men sitting on a bench. And one of them was the founder of Krav Maga, Amy Lichtenfeld. So Rick um, was then invited back to the first instructor's course in the U.S. with uh, two other individuals who brought it back. Um, that was a six-week brutal program, uh, which I simulated later on in life, um, where they basically condensed uh, several years of Krav Maga into six weeks and came out as instructors, the first American instructors. So I was privileged enough to, uh, to meet Rick, and um, he basically adopted me, and my Krav Maga journey began. Oh, that's pretty, pretty good stuff. You know, we don't, you, you may be, and, and forgive me to any past guests if I am forgetting you, but you may be the first guest to come on who started in Krav Maga. We've had plenty of people who have, you know, incorporated Krav Maga, you know, trained in multiple systems at the same time, or even some who left their more traditionally thought of traditional martial arts for Krav Maga. But I think you're the first Krav Maga native that we've had. I, I could be. And we're really um, lucky in that sense because when we, we, we train in our school, sometimes I'll get a, um, a, a terrific person, male, female, who's got an athletic background, but never has done any um, formal martial arts training. And in many ways, if, if the person really wants to learn and, again, has got um, you know, a good athletic base, they are the best kinds of students because we don't have to redo anything. Um, on the other hand, we have people who, with good boxing backgrounds or, or jujitsu backgrounds or any, any backgrounds that are, are very helpful. There are a couple of martial arts which, which we've got to uh, retrain the movements and, and hand position and footwork. But um, any, any background which would, would certainly um, make sense given your, your previous comment will be complementary to Krav Maga. Um, we build on whatever you have and whatever makes sense for you to use. Obviously, people are built differently, tall, short, wider, thinner. Male, female, strong, not so strong, but whatever, um, whatever their capabilities, Krav Maga has got to conform to them, to the person, and the person does not have to conform to Krav Maga. In other words, the system is is highly adaptable, and it can be customized, or it is customized for each person within certain parameters who who may have to use it. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, as you were as you were talking about some of the differences, you know, the, the idea of having to unlearn, you know, I've done some, some Krav Maga, some, some very short, you know, seminar, single class type of right. stuff mm -hmm. as I've traveled around and it's wonderful. It's phenomenal stuff. And it intellectually resonates with me pretty strongly. And, and, and some of the, you know, there's some, there's a cultural tie there. I was, I was raised Jewish. So, you know, you, you were talking about the sukkah earlier to celebrate the holiday of sure. Sukkot. 
Um, mm-hmm. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm right there on that side of it, on that side of it too. But yeah, yeah. absolutely. As I've participated, some of the, the training, the, the decades of non Krav Maga certainly got in the way. Yeah. Jay, and what, what makes, um, what sort of astounds me is that, uh, the particular defenses that were, um, were developed around weaponry, particularly firearms, it took Emi to recognize how to best disarm somebody where firearms had been used, you know, uh, larger ones in 1400s, uh, handguns began, you know, 1500s. The disarms are, are deceptively simple. Um, there are many variations out there now. Um, I believe, of course, the way I've been taught by Grand Master Haim Gidon in Israel, and I can explain a little bit more how I arrived on his doorstep. But um, the one crucial thing that, that we are, uh, as the original Israeli Krav Maga Association, um, weaponry and particularly handgun defense have got to be done correctly because if you don't do it correctly, you'll, you can get you killed. And so um, I can talk more about the weaponry and such. Um, but um, circling back, I, I guess it's a great segue. Um, Rick trained me for three years, and I said to him after law school, before going to work, um, I would like to learn this at its highest level. And of course, that meant going to Israel. Um, any, anybody uh, who obviously wants to go, if it's an Asian discipline or maybe Brazilian jiu-jitsu, would think to go to the source. And of course, that source for Krav Maga is Israel, Netanya. Um, so Rick contacted the original organization, the Israeli Krav Maga Association. Uh, and um, just before Emi passed away in 1998, um, we received a letter of invitation where Emi instructed the association to Hosts me as Rick's student. I was truly honored to, you know, to have Amy's quick audience uh, and for him to um, endorse my going over there. And I was um, met there with open arms by um, then and current Grandma Shaheim Gidon, 10th uh, Dan. And uh, Haim had been training with Amy um, since 1969. Um, he's only one of two, be- uh, two people who uh, was awarded an eighth degree black belt by Amy. And then in 1996, when he was awarded that eighth dan in a film ceremony, um, Emi Lichtenfeld said to Haim Gidon, uh, ninth and tenth dance were to come. So Emi um, appointed him, Haim, as his successor. And I know why. Um, the Krav Maga that I've been exposed to with Haim over the last um, 20 some years is, is non pari. It, it is obviously, I have my opinion, but it's the best in the world. And um, I went to Israel uh, for a six-week uh, private training course with Haim. I didn't know that it was going to be a private course at the time. Uh, when I showed up, there was um, uh, Egal and uh, Egal Beev and Yoav Crane, and then Haim uh, and Haim's other son showed up a little bit later to welcome me. And I asked, where are the other students? And they looked at me quizzically and said, well, you're the only one. Um, so I had a um, unparalleled six weeks of training with Haim six days a week. Uh, the most I did in one day, thank goodness I was still in my very early 20s, uh, was 11 hours a day. And um, that's how I began my uh, 20-some year journey back and forth to Israel. Um, I frankly cannot uh, remember how many times I've been, but it's been at least a couple times every year since. And uh, Grandma Shagidam was just here in November conducting a course, so he comes over regularly as well. Um, so I had uh, constant interaction. Um, the system is constantly updated. Uh, to meet um, modern threats, and um, I am not the best, but I certainly have been trained by the best. So, compliments to my Israeli instructors. Mm. Awesome. the The idea of someone dedicating themselves to something so I, I think we can say uncommon, maybe even rare. At that time, you said twenty years ago. I, I didn't hear anybody talking about Krav Maga twenty years ago. No, you're, you're, you're right on. Um, the first uh, Krav Maga article that I'm aware of was in 1986 in the Marine Corps Gazette. I, I've got copies of it. And uh, we do a lot of work with the Marine Corps. Um, I, you know, it was an honor to follow up on the 1986 article and to have gone uh, to the, uh, the Marine Martial Arts Center of Excellence, the MACE at Quantico, where the FBI and DEA are also located. We, we work with them there as well um, and help uh, augment. Uh, McMap, which is a Marine Corps martial arts program, amazing program. And um, Good Minds Think Alike, um, it's a military fighting style. Uh, we were brought in to um, give the uh, Marines a few uh, tactics focusing on lethality. 
and they very much appreciated it. Uh, it's a two-way street. I, I love learning from the Marines. And I can talk a little bit more about the Marines when uh, we, we discuss maybe about probably about competition and, and uh, non-competitions sure. and why, why that's so. Sure. You know, one of the things that I kind of want to, I don't want to have to talk about it, but I, ha- but I have to talk about it because in, in a lot of circles, Krav Maga is not a traditional martial art. But what a lot of people don't realize, and, and this, I, I'm going to say this, you know, Krav Maga predates Taekwondo. It, it, it may well, certainly the biblical it, reference is there. Well, I, I, don't, I don't mean it in that way. I mean, you know, we, we've done the research and, and we even have a Krav Maga episode and we'll link to it in the show notes, of course. And for anyone that they might be new, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is where we keep all that. But Krav Maga, you know, not, not by long, but Krav Maga is old enough, you know, certainly that, that we, can, we can call it that traditional stuff, you know, call it in with those traditional um, flavors of martial arts. But I I think that there are a lot of people who don't realize the age, they don't realize the legacy, and they don't realize that Krav Maga was started for, you know, very similar reasons to, to every other martial art and has adopted, kind of cultivated its own uh, cultural elements in the same way that karate and taekwondo and kung fu have based on where it comes from so i i I say all that to pose a question to you that i I don't believe i've asked on the show before do you ever feel left out from from martial arts conversation or from uh well i'll I'll leave it at that do you feel left out no um you know everyone who i've been fortunate to encounter is very generous with their knowledge and, and and their openness um People uh, have uh, said in somewhat of an accusing fashion that Krav Maga has stolen you know, uh, a number of things from different uh, martial arts. And um, I, in, in fact, I, I don't think someone's the correct word, but certainly borrowed. Amy was looking for a system that would um, combine the best of all worlds. And that's probably why Krav Maga could be considered so popular. And perhaps even it is the original mixed martial art, but without rules. The Krav Maga also developed specific defenses, and these are mostly um, uh, revolve around the weapon defenses for the impact, edged, and firearms. Those are specific to Krav Maga. Uh, Amy developed those. Um, I, I'm not aware of any um, disarms the, the way we do it um, for some of the traditional styles because, again, they are old. And, um, you know, flying kick to, dis- to knock a horseman um, off his horse is, is, is you know, a, a amazing skill set, a little esoteric, of course, not everybody can do it. But um, the, the other uh, focus, of course, with Krav Maga, uh, after it was formally adopted by the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, was to um, make it applicable and, um, quote, doable for everyone. So um, it's not to say the other martial arts are not simple, uh, they're not practical, but everything uh, in Krav Maga is, is based on utility, practicality, uh, and ease of use. So it's got to be um, the lowest common denominator, and it's not a criticism, but the, the average person has got to be able to do it. And if the average person can't do it, doesn't belong in the Krav Maga curriculum. And I think that that, that formation of Krav Maga, I think we could make the same claim for every martial art. Whenever a martial art has formed, it's taken a look at what else was available, what was needed, what made sense to the person putting together the curric- curriculum, if you will. Sure. Mm-hmm. And that became, you know, that style of karate or that style of taekwondo or judo or Krav Maga. So, I, you know, I don't think there's a, a, another way to do it. I don't think you can put together a effective and intended effective martial art without stealing or borrowing or right. however you want to look at it. And if, if you are, if you're saying I'm only going to use techniques that no one's ever used, you're not left with anything worth using. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Again, I'll, I'll repeat my, my hack and saying that good minds think alike that in, um, in, in, in the military systems where we, we've trained that there are going to be more similarities and dissimilarities. Um, so I, I absolutely agree with your, your, your salient point there. Great, great, great comment. Now, you mentioned that you've been to Israel more times than you can count. You threw around huge names. I mean, I, I don't think there are too many people training in Krav Maga today who have had a letter from Emi written. 
you know, with, with their name. I mean, that's. Oh, that's no, pretty- there, there, there are many. Emi granted many, many black belts. This happens just to be a letter where, where again, um, Emi instructed the association to welcome me. Um, the American training was in the early 80s, and I hadn't, Americans really hadn't been there um, often in the 90s. And, and so I was a curiosity to, to the guys who hadn't, uh, uh, you know, hosted Americans. Um, there, there are many splits in the Krav Maga community. Um, sure. Suffice to say, there, there are many, many good instructors out there. Um, we, we use the, the phrase that because not all Krav Maga is the same. Um, like all the other great martial arts, there are um, splinter groups. And unfortunately, Krav Maga, it's become highly commercialized and it's turned more into a fitness fad, uh, at least on the American side, I'm afraid. Um, but that's not to say there aren't many good Krav Maga instructors in the United States because there are. Um, but that, that could be another topic entirely. Sure. Sure. And, and I appreciate your sensitivity to it. That wasn't, I wasn't attempting to say that, that, you know, offshoots, you know, different, no, not different at all. Not looks at Krav Maga were, were, were wrong or inferior. No, of course. If we were to, if we were to take a, a, take a, a statistical look at the number of people who are training in Krav Maga today, who hold the honor of, of knowing who the founder you know, of, of knowing that the founder had written their name. I mean, that's a small percentage. And so what the only reason I bring that up is to say between that and, and being there in some of these, you know, at least relatively earlier days as Krav Maga was coming to this country and, and your trips to Israel, I'm sure you have a ton of stories. And so that was my setup. I, w- I, was, I wanted to offer up an opportunity. If you could tell us about one of the more impressive or dramatic or entertaining or funny, however you choose to look at it, your favorite story that you might offer to our listeners today. Sure. I, I will I relate that. And uh, it comes at my expense. Um, the first <laughs> class ones that, tend to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the first class that I ever uh, took was with Rick Blitzstein. And again, I, I, I was about 5'11", 195 pounds. I was still lifting, having, you know, played, played football. And, um, he said, David, come up here. And I said, oh, me? And he said, yeah. And I gradually went up. And he said, well, all right, stand there. And before I knew it, I was on my um, derriere, or my tachat in Hebrew, <laughs> with my wrist contorted with a size eight and a half foot on my throat, looking up at Rick, holding my hand, extending my body. And he had taken me down with a cavalier, uh, number one, before I even knew what was happening. And I looked up at him and said, wow. I just had my ass handed to me and I got to learn this. So uh, I, I certainly was humble and uh, I was amazed at how quickly he did that. Uh, he, he was not a big guy, uh, about, about five foot seven, five foot eight, maybe 160 pounds. And he took me down uh, effortlessly, seamlessly and had me at his mercy. So I was uh, most impressed. And that's how I, I began uh, my training. Mm. Wow. You know, I, I think we can all relate to that about, being put put on our butt unexpectedly, especially early on. But some of us, uh, and I'm certainly <laughs> raising my hand here, have had it happen more recently than than early in our in our training. You, you know, if you're if you're the best no, person there, there, in, there are, in another room. Many, right? many stories with, with, with training. Uh, we um, uh, we were doing some training in New York at a uh, um, uh, a place on 67th Street called McCor, and I had. Uh, Two of my uh, amazing Israeli instructors, Ohad Gida and Haim Son, uh, I think it, it was certainly one of the best practitioners in the world. And Igor Arbiv, um, another great guy who's trained me, as tough as they come. Anyway, we were walking in New York and uh, we had um, what are called red guns with us because we were going to do a demonstration at the Makur. Um, these were an M16, an MP5, but it was at night. And we were walking uh, on the Upper West Side of New York and it just so happened that Hillary Clinton, uh, first lady, was speaking at McCor that night. So there was a heavy Secret Service presence. And Egal, uh, because of his military training, I suppose, put that um, MP5 in, in his hands as walking down, probably forgetting that this was, um, you know, <laughs> civilian street in New York, you know, like he was on patrol. So the Secret Service, boy, did they get worried about that. We were cornered. Uh, we, we didn't have guns drawn on us because we identified ourselves right away. But uh, after that said, they came down and um, took a look at what was going on. And they were kind of interested in the training. And, you know, you couldn't have two better instructors than Ohad or Ego. Um, and, you know, again, we work with, with all the major federal agencies. So it came back years later. Um, 
but that's another story. And uh, as you say, there, there are many, many. What what really um, what what when I was teaching in in uh, New York, one story particularly also comes to mind where I had a gentleman uh, come um, and, and see me. His, his first name was Martin, and said, "Had I ever met a gentleman named Ernst Kobari, who was Amy Lichtenfeld's oldest living student?" I said, no, I, I, I don't, I hadn't, and, and I would be thoroughly honored to do so. He said, well, he lives in Queens. Would you be interested in meeting him? And I said, absolutely. At the time, my first book, uh, Krav Maga, was being published, and I tried to um, get the interview in that book that I'd done with Ernst, but the uh, publication date was too far advanced. But I did meet with Ernst in Queens, and I had an interview with him, and he explained to me how Krav Maga came to be and that it was developed firsthand to protect the Jewish community in Slovakia. He then went on to tell me how Krav Maga may have saved his life. Um, Ernst was 15 at the time uh, when Emi left uh, Bratislava, but he had been training with him for about 10 years. So Ernst really saw the beginnings of Krav Maga. Uh, Emi hadn't called it Krav Maga at that point, but it was the beginnings, the foundations of it. And um, one of um, the explanations Ernst gave me is that they um, were out, uh, about to go to synagogue for shul the day that World War II broke out. And so they were on their way to synagogue, and um, the mother, uh, their mother had pleaded with them not to go. It was dangerous, and she was right. She was prescient. So when they uh, left their apartment building, uh, dressed in their um, Saturday finery, they saw three Hitler Jugend beating up the local baker uh, on his way to um, work. So they didn't intervene, but they quickly ran back into their apartment building. The Hitler Jugend saw them do it, and they chased them. Now, Ernst and Tibor had been trained in what we'll call Krav Maga for many years, and when the three Hitler Jugend fought with the two Jewish boys, uh, the Hitler Jugend was severely beaten. Uh, Ernst and Tibor made short work of them. Um, it turns out that uh, the Hitler Jugend ended up in the hospital and the um, German Gauleteer or the uh, section commander, the, basically their, the, the military mayor, said, how did this happen to you? And the three Hitler Jugend explained that two Jews did that to them. Well, given the Nazis' convictions of racial supremacy and that Jews wouldn't fight and all the other unfortunate things that were um, you know, said at the time, the Gauleteer did not want this information let out that two Jews had beaten up three Nazis. So there were a number of articles that were published, which I had for this, this, the second book in which I was able to get it in by St. Martin's. And it's really one of my, my favorite stories. But it goes on that um, the um, Gestapo were after the um, two brothers, Tibor and um, Ernst. And straight out of Raiders of the Lost Ark, for those who are old enough or maybe young enough to have seen it with a leather coat and all that, um, they came after the two brothers who were then, um, they, they were compelled to escape up the roof through the stairs. And the edges of the, the uh, Gestapo were uh, drawing their uh, P-38 pistols. Ernst turned around and um, delivered a very strong um, straight jab to the lead Nazi, knocking him all the way down the um, stairs, uh, Tachat, or rear end over tea kettle. And Ernst and his brother escaped. So Ernst credited Krav Maga and its emphasis on combatives, on doing things correctly the first time, that every strike had to count, every movement's got to count because there's not uh, necessarily time for another. We, we emphasize a, um, something called Retsif, which is continuous combat motion, which is a seamless stream of, of combatives, but everyone's got to count because you don't know how many you'll be able to, to uh, administer before the next attacker's on you. So he counted that one. Straight punch, and Amy was a champion boxer, so as, as is Haim, the, the, the boxing skills, the pugilistic skills, are highly emphasized, knocking the Nazis backwards. And so he escaped, and he, he attributed Krav Maga to, to saving his life. And so uh, I always keep that in mind with, with training about how it was developed. Um, and fortunately, um, you know, was able to get to um, Egypt and then to Israel to uh, continue the training. Uh, he served as the chief military instructor for hand-to-hand -hand combat for the IDF up until the uh, late 50s, early 60s, um, when uh, he started to get some help. But 
um, what Amy emphasizes that Krav Maga is for, for everybody. It's not just for Jews. It's for anybody who's a law-abiding citizen who needs to be able to defend himself. And it's open to everybody, you know, provided their motivation is good and they're not criminals and um, all that sort of thing. So um, Ernst explained all this to me, and uh, that, too, is one of my favorite stories. So <laughs> I don't want to inundate you with stories. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Well, uh, please. I mean, that, that's kind of that's the whole purpose of this show. And, and you know, we, we've had episodes where I got to two, maybe three questions and the guest just kind of sure. went. <laughs> Understood. Understood. It's, it's fun. It's fun. You know, it. it, it there's there's something to be said for those historical elements and, and helping to bring some context to the why, the why the martial arts are important. I think when we look at the martial arts that have more, let's say, writing about them, you know, when we think about Funakoshi's books or we think about General Choi and, and, and the early days of Taekwondo, or when we when we talk about the early days of Krav Maga, there's certainly something to be said for hearing these stories and saying, you know, the roots of what I do now come from these very real situations and almost universally of, of this, the, we'll call them origin stories of martial arts that I have read or heard. There always is this, this, this overcoming element. There's almost biblical quality of, going from from being oppressed to rising up of of gaining that that confidence or that standing or however you want to look at it something that is so important and something that we still today put children into martial arts so they can gain that and good people gravitate towards good things that that is absolutely true um, said so much more eloquently than i just put it <laughs> no you, you you hit it on the head <laughs> forgive the pun <laughs> Cool. Now, outside of Krav Maga, is there is there stuff that you're passionate about? Is there is there time? Yeah, yeah. I I was a history major at Princeton, so I um I really enjoy history, which is also why I enjoy reading about other martial arts and their evolutions and and how they might have affected certain historical outcomes. Um, in fact, I I just in the process of, of finishing up my um sixth book on Krav Maga, but parallel to that, I'm writing a book on um, South Africa and the American Civil War, uh, which is a bit of an odd topic. Uh, admittedly, I, uh, at Princeton, we have to do a, a senior thesis, and I had a, uh, uh, probably the foremost uh, Civil War historian in the, in the world as my advisor, Professor James McPherson, um, who won a Pulitzer Prize in 1988 for his book, uh, Battle Cry Freedom. In any event, uh, he, he, I wanted to do something that hadn't been done before to break some new ground. And much had been written about the American Civil War. Um, but I was interested in on what South Africans, the tip of Africa, would think of the American conflict, uh, given their um, convictions of racial uh, supremacy, and what they would have thought uh, about America tearing its national fabric apart over the issue uh, of the, the evil institution of slavery. And they were very interested. So uh, I've been... Uh, I've been uh, uh, Toiling away at that, enjoying the writing of it, you know, sort of bringing history to, to life, and uh, you know, looking at it uh, from a, a little bit of a different perspective. So I do enjoy uh, reading and writing. Um, I I I can't say I enjoy weight training still because of all the uh, the wear and tear and injuries, but it's, I think it's very necessary for um, stamina, strength, and uh, most importantly, speed uh, in terms of training. Um, and and I, I enjoy traveling when I can do it as well. And unfortunately, my my Krav Maga training, I always try to if I can combine some teaching with um, some sightseeing, it's taken me as far afield as uh, Japan, uh, to Hiroshima, when we visited the Marines twice to, uh, to train them, their McMath instructors in Krav Maga. Um, been lucky enough to go to the UK to train with the, uh, the Royal Marines in Portsmouth. Um, Going to be in Europe training with some other um, military personnel. Um, even got to go to Hawaii to do a, a seminar there and, um, you know, work with some local, local people. So uh, traveling is great too. Um, done some stuff in Italy, uh, France. Uh, so that, that, it's nice to be able to combine your passion, my passion for Krav Maga, with a passion for travel. I mean, there's, there's nothing like traveling. There's nothing like opening yourself up to new experiences, whether it's, you know, martial arts or, or non-martial arts. I think the more, the more stuff we get to observe, I think just the better people we get, the more martial arts we train in, the better 
we are, the more tools we have and in our toolkit. I will add, Jimmy, you know, oddly, uh, it, maybe not so oddly, people can relate. Um, I've had to actually use the Krav Maga uh, overseas a little bit more than I would have thought. Really? Um, yeah, well, I, I, fortunately, it was all preemptive. Um, I was in France and, and walking through a park with a girlfriend. You know, I was in law school at the time, and uh, um, you had a bunch of uh, kids who were trying to pickpocket us. I knew what they were up to because they were fluttering newspapers. And, uh, you know, I, I swept her behind me, and I, I made sure her bag was in between my back and, and her front. And I, I basically took a fighting stance, and they, they, uh, you know, they backed off because they knew that I wasn't fooling around. Um, and another time, uh, uh, another girlfriend <laughs> later on in life, uh, I, I was in Italy teaching, but she had come and um, she was, had uh, some shopping in Rome and I, and I saw a motorcycle, uh, the two guys on it, um, suspiciously approaching from the rear revving. And they were uh, very keen on, on grabbing all of her, uh, her bags out of her arms. And I saw them approaching very quickly and I again whipped her behind and I prepared to we launched a straight kick to kick them uh, as they were passing right off that motorcycle. And I, and I about launched a kick, but they veered away. And that was, uh, uh, I guess, a good thing. Um, so uh, it comes in handy. Uh, one of the important things, as we said, you know, good people gravitate towards good things. The mindset has got to be, I will only use this if I have to. Um, we want to obviously promote de-escalation, de-confliction, um, escape, anything one can do to avoid um, physical confrontation. And that's both from a moral standpoint and a legal standpoint. I, I mentioned I'm a uh, non-practicing lawyer, but the, the legal training has come in uh, quite handy, literally and figuratively, um, with the uh, civilian training that we do. Um, if you have to defend yourself, you've got to be able to, uh, to explain what you did and why you did it. Um, I, I actually emphasize this a lot in, the, in this uh, book number six, Krav Maga Combatives, about um, a jury pool and what they're going to think of one's training. And there's probably a misconception out there that a, a martial artist in whatever discipline, because most jurors are not going to have firsthand knowledge, should be able to, uh, you know, to do what, um, uh, I don't know, what one of the martial arts heroes out there uh, could do. Um, maybe Jason Bourne or something, but not that violent. In other words, you should be able to, to put it some kind of wrist lock or some kind of pressure point hold or something where you can control this would-be aggressor and not injure him or her. So um, that, that factors in as well, you know, um, with, with all the, all the training. So I'll, I'll, uh, we'll get back to that if you'd like to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've, you've spoken a bit about the military and, and I know you've spent some time working with military personnel. You know, you, you said in, in Hiroshima and you were also telling me earlier before we came on the call that you'd done quite a bit of that. So I, I'm wondering if, if you might talk about what what, it, what is that like? Because I, the, the difference being, I, I would imagine, is that you have a defined endpoint. Most of us, when we start our martial arts training, it's not a six-week course or an eight-week course or, a, or even a, a two-year program. It is ongoing. But when you have an endpoint, obviously, as an instructor, it's a whole different way of approaching that, that curriculum. Uh, wonderful question. Um, I'll, I'll speak to curriculum uh, quickly then. Um, the Israeli Krav Maga Association uh, probably has the most extensive curriculum uh, for Krav Maga in the world. Um, it would only make sense given it's the original organization where, where so many of these, these other groups have, have uh, come from. Um, the actual materials go through um, fifth degree black belt. And at the highest black belt levels, that's where you'll find military training, police training, um, security training and, and you know, aviation security, um, all the professional skill sets, counterterrorism, that, and that, that sort of thing. Um, quite frankly, the, the reason I'm able to, to work with our military, which is a, uh, probably the greatest honor I've got along with our law enforcement, um, same can be said, is because of what Grandmaster Haim Gidon has, has taught me and uh, has imparted over the years. And that level of curriculum is really reserved for some of the, the, the top um, you know, people who have, have done it sometime understand the, uh, the core curriculum and can be entrusted with it. Uh, I've had books and, and the, the videos that we've done, um, not just mine, of course, but, but anybody who's, 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 you know, well-known or, um, you know, a, would, an expert in the field end up in terrorist training camps. Uh, we've been warned of this and that's why, um, very careful about what we disseminate. So what we 
train the military. The tactics and techniques are not something that we, we, we do uh, or we disclose publicly. Uh, I have a, um, a few references in, in, in a, a book by YMMA called uh, Krav Maga Professional Tactics, which um, shows uh, a number of military applications, but there's certain things that are, are purposely left out. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, co-op my very good friend who was the um, head of the McMap program. That's how I met him, uh, Master Sergeant Ron Jacobs. Uh, he was the hand-to-hand combat instructor for McMap, 6'3 black belt, one of the highest there. Uh, he's since retired and is now working in a, in a very special capacity with another military branch as their hand-to-hand combat instructor. We, we're, we're working together on that. Um, so when, I, when we first trained the military, uh, we were brought into uh, uh, Camp Lejeune by a uh, a great guy, Captain Frank Small, who had a uh, background in special operations. And um, it actually gets to a question that you, 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 you posed uh, about competitions. And in Krav Maga, um, although the IDF has had uh, a number of competitions, the nature of Krav Maga, the anatomical targeting, uh, the injury factor, or the, uh, the idea of maiming and debilitating people is not conducive to tournaments. So. Um, when I have had competition, let's call it, it's the military guys who are all as tough as they come testing what we do. Um, I put myself in, in, in some difficult positions with um, the Marines in the beginning to show that we could get out of some of the most difficult uh, chokeholds, for example, because we could do that safely. Um, except one of the great Marines who later became a great friend, uh, he had me in a, a guillotine on the ground and he, he was uh, with his hooks around choking me. And I said, I wouldn't get in this position if I could help it. But here's how Krav Maga would defend it. And um, he was really, and he said, sir, can I really choke you? I said, yep, three things are going to happen. You either uh, choke me out uh, and I'll tap. You'll choke me out and I won't tap. Or I'll get out of this. And, of course, my, the third option was my preference to get out of it. And, and I did. And the reason I was able to do it, he started saying under his breath, oh, sir, you're, my eyeball's coming out. I said, so, and I, because I was being choked, just so let it go. And he did. And we, and we became great friends after that. So um, when we talk, when we deal with military training, we're talking about uh, a level of uh, uh, visual training that, that can only come uh, with, with a military mindset, which can be uh, adopted for the street. Um, the Marine Corps uses cadavers to test certain things out. Um, I haven't gone that far, but, you know, we've shared some knowledge on that. Um, but truly, it's an honor. Um, the Marine uh, training with some of the best in the world. We've trained all five branches now, uh, Air Force, uh, Army, uh, Coast Guard, Navy. And um, we know that they may have to use these tactics. This is not something that's just an insurance policy. This may actually come uh, literally uh, handy. Uh, same with police. And probably the police are the um, group who use uh, Krav Maga and like-minded tactics the most because obviously for arrest and control, you need to put your hands on somebody. And that goes to one more factor, uh, which is, um, I would say, really p- particular to Grandmaster High and Dunn training, is that we conduct the training against concerted resistance. In other words, the person is not just going to let you do or have your way with what you intend to do to them. They're going to fight back literally tooth and nail and try to um, destroy your anatomy just as much as you might have to injure their anatomy. Uh, in other words, it, it's, it's not a passive type of thing. They're not going to be cooperative partners in certain elements. Obviously, in the beginning, with Krav Maga or any good fighting discipline, martial arts, you want to help your partner. You got to be a good partner in the training. But the best partners in Krav Maga at the highest levels don't allow you to choke them, don't allow you to uh, simulate an arm break. Uh, they don't allow you to, um, you know, to, to, to win. Uh, you, you've got to have a, uh, a determined opponent if the training is going to be realistic. So that's one of the best things about working with our military. And um, we don't replace what they do. All the military branches are very well trained. We just um, supplement and um, hopefully give them a few more uh, arrows for their their, their well-stocked quivers. I've had the privilege of teaching quite a few people over the years, but I've never taught anyone that I knew was was bound for the military. Mm. More than you know, a class or two here or there. Is there anything different going through your mind when you're teaching, we'll say, civilians versus military people because of the fact that they are so much more likely to need it? Yes, it's also a two-way learning street. Um, Again, when working with some special operation guys, um, the best of the best, let's put it that way. Um, 
I, again, go with um, profound respect, hat in hand, uh, and, 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 and defer to their, um, their, their combat experience and, and get feedback to make what we do better. Um, make no mistake, what I've been taught by Gray Master D. Don and, and Rick and others is uh, proven. Uh, the um, respect is mutual. I'm honored that, that they'll, they'll, they'll uh, listen and incorporate what we do, and indeed they have. Um, recently, we just trained with a um, special forces group going abroad in some anti-abduction tactics, a curriculum which I, I had to develop for them. Um, and uh, they're just, uh, on a personal level, some of the best people we'll ever meet. Their um, dedication to our country is, is, is unparalleled. It's the same thing with the police as well. Um, we know that these, these brave men and women are going out and um, doing their job. Um, one of the emphasis that I, I've tried to place, again, is that um, the public um, must be protected. There are definitely some problems in, in policing with the use of force, excessive use of force that don't adhere to the Graham versus Connor standard. But what the uh, general public doesn't understand, martial arts would, artists would, is that it's very difficult to control somebody um, let alone passive resistance to active resistance too. So um, we know that they've been there and they've done that and that they've gotten appreciation. And that's one of the reasons, again, um, we've been so lucky. Um, we're really one of the few Krav Maga groups in the U.S. So they're, they're a couple, but we doing a lot of military training. And to date, we've had no, no pushback. Nobody's questioned it because we've proven how we do it and why we do it. Um, I had to prove why our, our rear naked choke defense on the ground worked against you know, some special forces guys just recently. Uh, top level guys in jujitsu, and, and I was able to defend it. Although I obviously wouldn't want to get in that position, uh, we call that a, a negative five, where you're you're a complete disadvantage. But if we can get out of a, a, a position of complete disadvantage, such as negative five, obviously if we're in a, a neutral or a prepared state, you know we're going to do that much better. And, and they seem to appreciate that. Nice. Now you've talked about books, books that you've written, as, as we've discussed. You know. Your, your past today. So let's, let's take a moment and, and step out and, and talk about that, your, your writing career through all this. Sure. Uh, I, I referred to that um, senior thesis about South Africa and the American Civil War. That's how I sort of uh, began my, my writing career in college, and I, and I published a few articles from it. Um, I was approached while teaching in New York uh, by St. Martin's Press, a uh, very, very big press. I was, I was really quite um, flattered. And um, the editor, Marion, said, hey, we'd like to do a book on Krav Maga. We want you to do it. Would you um, like to do it? And if so, do you need a ghostwritten, uh, which means another writer? And then I, I saw my name to it. I'm not too keen on that concept for anybody. Uh, but I said to her, hey, I, I've written a thesis. I, I did really well with it, and I'd like to give it a shot. So that uh, was my first book, uh, Krav Maga and the Central Guide, published in 2004. And um, that launched uh, a writing career. I was fortunate four years later to uh, do another one for St. Martin's Press Advanced Krav Maga. And then um, uh, I seem to produce one every four years, but I, I, um, I'm, I'm getting better at it because I produced uh, the uh, books uh, four and five in, in 2016. They were both published about three months apart. And I don't know anybody, uh, any idiot like me who writes two books at a time. <laughs> but that's what I did. Um, and there are a couple more. Uh, there's one going into publication in June um, 2019. Uh, really, it's a, I'm just editing it. As, as, before we were spoke, I was editing it uh, called Krav Maga Combatives, which is focusing on Krav Maga's uh, most important combatives, in my opinion, and, and, and something called Retsif, which is continuous motion, uh, compound combatives, and, and, you know, that sort of thing. So um, I really enjoy it. Um, we we, we, we uh, have gone to photographs for the last many books. Um, it, I've got great help from all of my um, fantastic partners and instructors, and I'll just launch about there. Ronaldo Rossi, Don Melnick, Chris Eckel, Paul Carleen. These are all our, our top instructors who have helped me, and I'm, I'm in their debt, along with everybody else who's posed in the, uh, the photograph show, Drew and um, Mike Osgood, uh, Sean Hogs, a bunch of others as well. So um, it, it, it makes us a better Krav Maga instructors and, and Krav Maga practitioners when we do these books because it tests everything that we do. And it really makes uh, an instructor that much better when you've got to write it out and explain it without having the ability to show it, you know, to put it into words, to put it into photographs and have to take the uh, reader through it. Um, so I've, I've got another couple of books in, in, in the docket as well, uh, dealing with ambushes and, and skilled fighters, which is, in other words, a trained fighter. Um, another person, perhaps, and you know, another discipline. It could be anything, um, 
But in other words, this is defending against somebody who's trained. It's not just an, a, uh, an amateur throwing a, uh, a wild hook punch or, you know, push or, or some kind of, um, you know, uh, half measured tackle. Um, so that's also what we would, the Grad McIvan training is, is to be able to fight against somebody who's trained and trained well. Right on. Now you're, you're still going. You're not slowing down. I mean, if, if I'm doing the math right, we're, we're around 25 years of Krav Maga. Is that, yeah. is that accurate? Mm-hmm. Okay. Sure. You know, most people don't do something for 25 years. They, they, they get bored. They fall off. You know, unfortunately, even with martial arts. But, you know, you're, you're still training, traveling, teaching, writing. Clearly, this is something that continues to resonate with you. And, and I, I think your passion is quite evident from our conversation today. So the question is why? Why are you still so passionate about this pursuit? Oh, that, thank you. That, that really is a um, a very good question. <laughs> I uh, and, and I try I, to ask good questions. No, I think it's it's great. Um, I, I I I do love Krav Maga. Um, I I enjoy. You know, I love teaching. In fact, um, I, I do do other parallel things in in, in private equity and technology. But um, it is a great way of staying fit. Um, and what intrigues me the most is that it needs to keep developing. For example, everybody these days has got a mobile phone in your hands. So you need to be able to fight with a mobile phone in your hand. Um, we've done some testing and I've, I've got some uh, scientific data that um, if you're well-trained, you obviously should drop the device unless you're gonna use it as a weapon of opportunity or an impact weapon. But most people, because we're conditioned not to drop the device, are not gonna do it. So therefore you've got to tailor your defense with your um, your, your favorite thing in the world in your hand, probably your, your mobile device, um, and be able to, you know, defend it. So these are the kinds of things that, you know, technology evolves, Krav Maga's got to evolve with it. Um, I, that's just one example for, you know. Another one is um, like road rage to, um, you've got this mobile device, you can record what's happening, stay in your vehicle, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, we, we have the curriculum, but we've constantly got to uh, adopt and adapt it. And um, on a professional level, uh, again, with the air marshals and others, uh, learning how to, for example, defend against a, a blade on an airplane following the horrific 9-11 events. Um, there's still people out there who, who want to do us great harm. And they, um, be, make no mistake, are, are studying what we're studying. In fact, um, my last trip to Israel on page, uh, I think, obviously, it was page 28 of the Jihadi Manual. The um, it directs the uh, jihadists to learn Krav Maga. So we need to be able to counter even what we're teaching. We keep that close to the vest. Um, and it, it continually evolves. And as we discussed earlier, one of the, um, the driving factors for me, the motivating factors is helping the, the professional security community, the law enforcement, the military communities um, come home at night. And, um, and, and if, if possible, control a suspect very, very quickly uh, for the police that is using distractions, which are, 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 are lower body distractions and not police combatives. There's a difference that we, we're, we're, we're very careful to make. Um, people shouldn't be getting hit in the head repeatedly because they're not cooperating with a police officer. There are different ways to do it. Um, saves the officer um, hands from being you know, damaged against somebody's head. But more importantly, it, it also um, preserves the, um, the health of the, the suspect. You know, I, I, I'll get, get more into that. But the um, point is, is that we're, we're delivering it to people who need it. Um, we don't do it for the, the thanks. It is a business, but we do a lot of it pro bono because that's, that's what it should be helping, you know, giving back to our community. Very well said. And I'm sure that there are quite a few nodding heads as folks are listening to what you're saying right there. So this is your chance to let people know how they can find you those, those books, you know, I, I don't know if your seminars are available for people to schedule with you, but you know, let people know where to find you online and uh, absolutely. Oh, I, 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 we are, we've got a couple of our, our main training centers in um, New Jersey, in uh, Bordentown and Cherry Hill for the moment. Uh, we do have an, an affiliate program where we're uh, highly uh, regulated who will take and we vet uh, very closely who's interested in Krav Maga. But um, we have many, many seminars uh, that one could come to regardless of your background. And that's the best thing about Krav Maga is that um, whatever discipline uh, one might study, you can always take and uh, pick and add, you know, Krav Maga tactics, discard what you don't like, add what you do like. And that's why so many people are, uh, I would say, you know, uh, gravitated 
are gravitating towards Krav Maga are compelled to try it because it's additive. And whatever um, you like, you take. Whatever you don't like, you don't take. So um, we have a, a couple of websites I, I'd be delighted to, to, to mention. One um, is uh, www.davidkonkravmaga.com, all one word. Um, it is not David Kahn Krav Maga in the sense of my own brand. I teach under Grandmaster Gidon, but it's about our instruction and what we offer. And uh, another one would be for the online training, if somebody were interested, um, www.masteringkravmaga.com. And for our schools, one final one. <laughs> Uh, www.israelikrav.com. Um, so again, one last time. You've got uh, www.davidkonkravmaga, all one word, dot com, uh, masteringkravmaga.com, and israelikravmaga.com. Awesome. And of course, again, we'll have those links for anyone who is not in a position to write down with pen and paper, as sure. I am. Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I really appreciate your time. This has been a, a really fun conversation. I, I feel like we got a good vibe going. So I, I, I thank you for that. You've made my job very easy today. But I'd love to ask you for, for one more favor. And, and longtime listeners know we do this every episode. What parting words would you give to the folks today? No, thank you. That's, that's super to end with this. Um, all training is good. You know, obviously, we believe strongly in our Krav Maga will complement any style in which you train. Um, and as far as, uh, actual self-defense, the, uh, the actual street defense versus a dojo, um, mentality or a, the ability to uh, simulate what will actually happen, I would highly encourage, uh, people to watch some actual attacks on, um, the internet, YouTube in particular, and watch the speed and ferocity at which somebody will attack with open hands, personal weapons, a knife, or even shoot somebody at close range to understand the, uh, the dynamics at play and the um, often lack of recognition of an incoming attack. There were indicators or kinesic indicators that one could have picked up if you analyzed the film. Um, but that really will sort of drive home um, what we've got to prepare everybody for that which they'll hopefully never face. And that lastly, uh, you know, over and above training, the only fight or self-defense situation you're sure to win, everybody will probably smile, is that which you don't get into. Deconflict, deescalate, and walk away. I seem to be getting pretty lucky lately in that the guests that we're having on the show are just, they're just such great people. And we're spending a lot of time after the episode closes just chatting, chatting about life and martial arts and hoping that our paths might cross so we can train together or even just have a cup of coffee or a beer. I'm so fortunate in what I do. And I really got that sense from Chief Instructor Khan today that he feels just as fortunate about what he does. And so I thank you, sir, for your time and for sharing everything that you have today. If you want to check out the show notes with photos and links, maybe to the books that we talked about, websites, those are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find all of our products, our apparel, our shoes, hats, uniform, sparring gear, all that at whistlekick.com. Don't forget, Podcast 15 saves you 15% on everything over there. We're on social media, at Whistlekick on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you want to get to me directly, my email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's all I've got for you today. I'll be back soon. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 